back indeed yeah i heard i read that report earlier too um what's really interesting is they keep on applying the same the same tactic is expecting a different answer it's like doesn't the west get it russia and china aren't capitulating each time they do they embarrass not only syria and iran but they guarantee that they're going to have to assemble a more vigorous response like with this bomber that blew up the brother-in-law of assad and several other generals this means security is going to increase. It means the if Syrians are going to ask the Russians for the S-300 or S-400 systems. It means the missile batteries are going to be in place. They're going to probably ask for troop uh, support from China and Russia. Uh, it's going to increase more hardware. It means that our Navy is in more danger because if they do naval operations, and it looks like they're doing something that could be provocative against Syria, Syria is going to fire maybe first. And that means could we could have... I, 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 the, you, you know... This is a complex uh, thing that's evolving. Uh, Syria is the back door to Iran, uh, but they want to take out Syria. They want to take out Iran. They want to take out Hezbollah in Lebanon. A few years ago, Israel uh, created a pretext and invaded uh, southern Lebanon. I knew they were going to get their butts kicked because they knew Syria had bought a large number of the very powerful but relatively inexpensive AT-14 combat and a tank missile. They absolutely chewed up the Israeli uh, main battle tanks, and after a few weeks, Israel tucked its tail, withdrew, and declared victory. Um, yeah, it's not typical of Israel declaring victory while they retreat. Yeah. Well, the Israelis are, are, are extremely arrogant, and uh, that's, that's a shame because the route they're going down now is a route of national suicide. The global banksters, uh, the global banking cartel families that, that are, they want a world war, they want total global chaos, they're quite prepared to sacrifice Israel. Many of, many of the banksters are Jewish, but many aren't, but they don't care. Uh, Israel is just a, a chip in the game, and uh, they, they could care less. And that's basically the position that many of the, the intelligence people in Israel that are now retired or have been screaming for some time, this route is a, a route of national suicide. But, uh, the, you know, Satan tends to blind uh, his minions and Netanyahu and the characters around him. All they know is blood, death, destruction, and the usual Mossad uh, false flag operations. Now, this yesterday we had... The, the, the destruction of the most of the uh, Syrian war cabinet, uh, which struck very close to, to home, literally killed uh, Assad's brother-in-law. But also you had this bombing in Bulgaria of a tour bus. Now, Bulgaria is very close. The Bulgarian intelligence service is very close to the Mossad. And uh, they, the Mossad trains their intelligence services. Of all the Eastern European countries, Bulgaria has the most oppressive surveillance system. I mean, literally, you if you go into Bulgaria, you have to provide receipts. Where did you spend your money? Did you go out to eat? Where you need a receipt? They watch everything. And... And essentially, um, 
I believe that the attack was a Mossad false flag. I think they killed their own people uh, for several reasons. It, the, the, if you look at the timing, three things actually happened yesterday. They arrested, they dug up some old guy about 100, close to 100 years old, who, and they said he was a war criminal from uh, World War II. Well, you know, I'm 61. I was born four and a half years after World War II ended. My late father would be 93, and he was a young man in his 20s in World War II. So, you know, you're talking, uh, they, they, Israel always plays the victim card. The trouble is they're running out of these uh, people they can claim were uh, killed all kind of Jews in World War II because the people were in their late 90s or 100s. So they, they arrested this guy. They also did a bombing and killed a bunch of innocent uh, Israeli civilians on a bus. Uh, the guy, the mastermind behind it, okay, guess what? He uh, was a prisoner at uh, Gitmo, G Guantanamo Bay, for several years. The man was tortured. The man was fed drugs. Uh, he is a classic Manchurian candidate. Um uh, and uh, so anyway, I, at the same time that they're blowing up Assad's uh, war cabinet, uh, they blow up their own bus with some of their own people, and they arrange for arrest of some old guy that they claim uh, is a, some great war criminal from 60-some uh, years ago. Uh, you it's know, so stupid, you isn't two, it? two events, uh, all were victims. In, in, and, and they claim within hours, too. They they claim this within hours. That's what I find bizarre, is these people come out. Israel, the, the Iran did it was through some kind of anti-Semitic word. How would they know within hours? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. Netanyahu, the bodies were not even cold from the bombing. And Netanyahu right. is claiming that well, uh, Iran you want to did see it, the, Hezbollah. Yeah. Others were claiming Hezbollah and Syria right. did it. Uh, if you look at the, the uh, Israeli news media and all the senior politicians, uh, there were three, th three people, three groups guilty. Syria, Iran, and Hezbollah. And some politicians picked Two of those three others, uh, the media picked the different two, but uh, it all came. And, and how do they know? You know, if their intelligence was so good, why didn't they stop it? Right. Uh, the yeah. reality is, it's it's part of the ongoing. Uh, it's, it's more like a 9/11. It's the operation. it's like a report yeah. review I did on the report this morning on 77 bombing Britain, that they had hired four flunky Muslims to act as the flunkies while they're doing a war game simulation in Britain, and then they blew up their own trains with bombs underneath the trains where these so-called Muslim bombers couldn't even get. They proved that the cars were blown up below the actual floor yeah. of the of the train it wasn't blown up by bombs inside in backpacks so what we have is fools now I, I sometimes deal with what I call vicious ignorance and it's whether it's people that you you meet on the street or people that are relatives or people that email or call you know your level of stupidity out there if you don't want to face the music that your government is the terrorist the terror of the 20th century the number of people millions of people killed well not by terrorists by lone gunmen or whatever it's governments it's the government of soviet union russia it's the government of china it's the government of the united states that did the false flag in 9-11 it's the government of, of the united states that did oklahoma city and these governments are actually collaborating to even create these super plagues they want to foist in the earth like the uh, H1N1 flu, H5N1 flu. Uh, if you're viciously ignorant to the point where you don't believe that, for example, you know, they... And I heard an interesting report uh, the other night from, uh, you know, uh, and I, I've got to give him on the program too. But he basically said, you know, we have... In a sense, the Mossad and the Mossad-operated uh, senators and the lobbying agencies inside America that literally steer American policy. I mean, it's just ridiculous. In the same way, we even try to uh, to capitulate to the Pakistanis. We have an America. We have basically. Yeah, you know, Israel's a, Bill, uh, Dr. Bill. Israel's the size of maybe Rhode Island, right. and they're a foreign country that we have donated. Uh, about five times uh, the entire amount we spent on the U.S. space program. Right. Uh, now, here's the point. When we have this kind of situation, we have Americans starving. We have 44% of the population now on food stamps or some form of financial support. And yet, we're putting our hand out. And by the way, Israel suppresses Christian evangelism oh, inside, inside Israel. And uh, they are one of the most racist nations on earth. And yet, we support them. 
we're crazy. And again, the same way, why do we give millions to the Pakistanis? So, uh, they, and they won't release this doctor. We'll, we'll get back and talk about that in a moment. Just got an uh, email, believe it or not, from uh, John Moore, um, sent out to me very re- just recently here. He said in the, the title at the top of the email says, No Need for Panic is the title of my paper I wrote for Fall 2005, published in January 2006. The note is that follows to, I'll follow up to my paper Tuesday, July 10th. One of my private trusted sources told me the following. He heard a woman telling her employer that she attended a classified briefing of spouses of DOD personnel that are part of the COG, Continuity of Government Contingency Planning. They, this may contain 1% or 2% of all DOD personnel. Prior to the briefing meeting, she had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. During the briefing, she was told about the Nibiru, Planet X, Wormwood. I call it the Passover star. This is a star that they used to call the Satan star, Heraclitus, the destroyer. It's the winged uh, star of ancient, uh, the, uh, the cartouches in the ancient uh, temples in Egypt and Samaria. Uh, this, this is very well known. The uh, soon-to-happen uh, flooding of the Atlantic coast has shown a map that was very closely resembling the map of my DVD showing the flooding of North America coastal areas. She was told to prepare for an evacuation order that could come soon. They were told that they may have as much as two weeks' warning. They may not. Now, uh, I've done a lot of research on this, and I can tell you that uh, not only when my scientific research and spirit kind of lines up, then you have to take notice. And what I have is that the star that I call the Passover star that is approaching our inner solar system from the southern ecliptic is the exact same red dwarf star, class 3 red dwarf star, that actually approached what we call the Passover star at the time of Moses. It's the star that caused the gravitonic and volcanic events that caused Thera to explode to destroy the Minoan civilization in the eastern Mediterranean. And the plume of radiation... Wasn't was the that the, the uh, uh, Atlantis... Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is the Atlantis uh, myth- mythology that had uh, that was there, and there are also colonies from this area that were destroyed out in the Atlantic Ocean too, beyond the gates of Gibraltar, right. which is out out in the ocean because there were areas in the Sargasso Sea that they're now finding evidence there were there, there were giant areas of, of of land that literally become submerged. Now, what I mean by all of this is that. I don't, I'm not putting dates on it, but I can tell you that we have a Brazilian astronomer who's already come forward on this. I have contacts about the South Pole Telescope, and I, I can tell you that we know we've been monitoring this object since the early 70s, actually, doing the, the Explorer, one of the early Explorer satellites that was sent out there called Voyager, was sent out literally to find out if this object was present in the Oort cloud, which is beyond the edge of the solar system. Uh, because they found evidence uh, going right back to Tycho Brahe and other astronomers over a hundred and some years ago about the perturbations of Neptune, etc., indicating from their calculations, from Newtonian calculations, that there had to be something affecting the gravitonics. Well, that meant there was a uh, a very large if object creating gravity waves that affected the movement of other objects in deep space, uh, probably up to 50 times the uh, diameter of the solar system. Now, he goes on here. Monday, I had another private source in Homeland Security verify the information of the above-mentioned briefing. Today, I spoke with another source, Dr. Mr. Mike Harris. Mike is a fellow talk show host in RBN and the time slot following mine. Mike has a private trusted source who is a high-ranking member of the Foreign Intelligence Agency. This source tells Mike that Nibiru will make its closest passage to Earth coming into our solar system on August 17, 2012, and its closest passage outward bound on September 26, 2012. Mike has verified this intelligence with another private source, a former high-ranking member of the Reagan administration. And intelligence received so far points to the Atlantic Ocean event, probably connected to the Canary Island risk of a landslide penetrating, generating a tidal wave. Now, I've been in contact with, and I will be getting more technical contact with the San Jose Tsunami Research Center and the one in Zurich, Switzerland. And what I have seen there 
from the evidence I've gathered so far, is that the tsunami that would be generated from the sliding off of, and uh, this is from the BBC special and others, you can go on YouTube and find it yourself. Yeah, the, I, I've the, seen can, that. I mean, yeah, that it, is, it, a, is a real serious danger. Right, and what happened is it's already started sliding in the mid-80s, and they've been monitoring it. They have GPS monitoring it down to centimeters of movement of this chunk of this island. And it's already forming what's called steam jets. There's an area near this area called El Hero that's literally building a new island from the volcano, literally rising up through the ocean. If the steam literally makes this block of this island slide, just this landing in the ocean will create a wave that will strike North America with a wall of water between six and 800 feet high, traveling at 600 miles an hour, just under the speed of sound. That means the speed of a, of a jumbo jet coming toward America with a wall of water. Now, we know, remember now, the tsunami that struck Sendai, Japan, I think was, what, 100 feet high? 80, 100? 100, I think. I think 120, okay. So yeah, let's say we'll talk about this one. This will be roughly six to eight times higher, carrying somewhere around, when you talk about exponentially, talking about around a thousand times more energy. And because of the geography of the east coast of the United States, which is, you can go up to between 100 and 300 miles in, and you're no higher than 300 feet above sea level, large areas of the, of the, of the eastern seaboard will be swamp. And that means we have just between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore uh, and uh, Boston, the United area and Boston, you have somewhere around 85 to 90 million people living within 100 miles and, of the coast. And lots of Fukushima-type nuclear reactors, by the way. Tons of them. I mean, it's just chock-a-block full of nuclear reactors, and none of them have a station backup backups. Uh, none of them have evacuation procedures that will work. And if the island slides off at 2 a.m., uh, you know, Eastern Standard Time America, those people will be asleep and have only a two-hour window to get out of town, to get out of Dodge. Those freeways will be jammed. Anybody with a helicopter on the helipad on their roof that's a billionaire will be out of town and gone to his, his, his uh, rescue well, place. Well, you have to get high. you got to get high. Now, the problem is they're even telling people that they may be going to buildings. So I want to read on in this. One of the things I learned is the U.S. Military Intelligence School, as well as being criminal investigators in 73, this is John speaking, was to look for reliable sources who didn't know each other giving the same information. Here we have four reliable sources all saying the same thing. Blink, blink. I mean, one of the reasons why I have John on is John is a straight shooter. He's a believer, he's a straight shooter, and he's a good investigator, which is why he's a forensic investigator. That's his job right now, by the way. Forensic investigator for murder and major crimes. He's like uh, Quincy, you know, the Quincy, the uh, pathologist mm -hmm. investigates. He's a Quincy, okay? And he's real smart. I trust his intelligence is enough to take personal action based on it. We human beings uh, go through every 3,600 3, years. We're going through this every 3,600. The range of effects will run from mild irritation to killing most inhabitants on Earth. Now, well, what I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you this much. He was right on the money uh, with finding Dr. Zakari yeah. and exposing what the British uh, petroleum oil disaster has done. We're living right. in, I'm in the Midwest right now. It's 100 degrees outside, but it feels closer to 110. With uh, we, yeah. we have a little bit of humidity. Nope. The drought in the Midwest is a disaster of that's going to be a biblical proportion because right. of weather all over the world. India is now going well, to be The United Kingdom everybody, is, is flooded yeah. and cold. Alaska now, everybody, is cold. Now, now, Tim, everybody is twitchy. Even the Iranians are trying to accuse the Americans of using HARP. HARP is a system where if you're a ham radio operator, it's 100,000 times more power than, than a, any regular radio station. It's not HARP. This is the destruction of the loop current. And by the way, I have I talked to Dr. William Ray. I have other sources on this. They are using thousands of gallons of Corexit 9500, which is neurotoxic from Exxon Mobil, when oil spill leader 2 could be used every day in the Macondo because it's still leaking. Two years later, and they're settling all the lawsuits, capping all the legal actions off. The Gulf is still toxic and they're still releasing it. You mean it. our government is lying to us? Yeah. Yeah. Gee, golly, Just like, gee, that's hard to believe. Yeah, exactly. Back in a moment. <laughs> We are joined by the illustrious, uh, this is his radio name, by the way, not his real name, Chris Harris, the uh, nuclear safety specialist. And by the way, to use a little humor here, one of the things that I've been accused of recently is the Forrest Gump syndrome, just like Forrest Gump being written in the, with, you know, advanced video arts to shaking hands with John F. Kennedy and doing all these amazing things. Guess what? Um, 
whether it's Deagle or, or Chris Harris or Tim Alexander or Alex Jones or anybody who's out there just doing their job. There's two commandments God gave. Love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if there's only one character defect, which I have besides speaking too fast and interrupting people, is I don't have reverse gear and I don't have the fear gene. I'm not afraid. I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm not stupid, though. You know, To be fearless doesn't mean careless. To be fearless means you're fully aware of how dangerous it is out there and you're fully prepared for it, including whether it's coronal mass ejections, backup power supplies, water, armaments, food supply, also being ready to help your neighbor. You can't give what you don't have. And uh, the same thing goes in the East Coast. If, for example, if we have backup power supplies or extreme weather, which which is going to come this year, that are going to knock out the power supplies, we don't have a proper nuclear response uh, in terms of safety procedures for our nuclear reactors itself, whether it's a big earthquake striking the New Madrid fault system where literally 25 reactors are sitting within strike zone there just to the New Madrid system. The East Coast is chock-a-block full of most of the reactors in America are on the East Coast. We're sitting there just waiting like sitting ducks for a tsunami to hit them. And uh, to talk about this in Fukushima, give us the latest updates, including San Onofre, which is just a disgusting mess, that uh, finally they came up with a report at the last minute. Tell us what's going on, Chris, in terms of this latest report and what's happening. Okay, Dr. Bill, Tim, yeah, I'm just gonna, I think there's a little bit of Forrest Gump in all of us, I suppose. So there, well, the Forrest Gump, you know what it is? God calls us and he says, you know, I'm going to call Chris Harris, and I'm going to call Deagle. You know, he says, and God says, many are called, but few are chosen. Now, who does the choosing? Chris, you answer it. Who does the choosing? Oh, many God, are called, but few are chosen. Yeah. God does the calling, we do the choosing. Well, we're with, no. that's true. We choose. We're the choosers, okay? We're not the callers. God is a caller. God can call a million, but only ten may respond, just like Gideon's armory. Well, we're, 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 we are doing, um, I, I kind of think it's like the Archangel Gabriel's uh, 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 helpers. We're, we're getting the word out to people about what's really happening. And we're what the people witnesses. do with that we're word the, we're, is up to them. Well, yeah, exactly. We don't save anybody. We don't change anybody's mind. In fact, I tell people, some people say, you just think you're like a cult. You want to change everything. I say, no, I don't. I don't want to change anybody's mind. Nobody. I can't change your mind. All I can do is I can maybe change your perspective. I can maybe ask, make, get you eventually to ask a better question. And then maybe if you research it, you'll say, oh, my gosh, maybe, maybe Deagle's not a nut. Maybe he is as smart as he thinks he is. Maybe the people he has on are experts in their area. Maybe the cohesive mass of evil crap that he's talking about really is real. And if we respond to it, we can stay healthy with our Nutrimeds. We can protect ourselves from radiation from Fukushima. We can respond with the toxic GMO foods. We can take action to get rid of toxic crap in our food like aspartame. We can deal with toxic environmental and financial policies. We can really get Jesus back into the churches and Satan out. We can get rid of Islam and neutralize our foreign policies or we have stupidity. Guess what? It's going to take some repentance. And those are the steps to talk about repentance. Repentance isn't just, oh, I'm sorry, God. You know what God says? God says, and this is a word for me saying from God, repentance is to change your direction, turn around and walk in the other direction, which means that requires intellectual effort, it requires spiritual effort, and it requires putting your neck in your, in your finances and your family and your reputation and your personal relationships with your family, your friends, and your colleagues on the line. And if you don't do that, you're not, as Jesus said, you're not a follower of the Most High God. That's why he said, you know, father and mother is not your biological father and mother. It's your friends and relatives who believe in the Most High God. Your, your, your biological and genetic relatives are not, are not your brothers and sisters. In, in terms of God's kingdom, your brothers and sisters can be in a foreign country. They can be believers in China. They are people who have finally grasped the need that you, if you don't serve God, you cannot do anything other than serve the dark side. You know, like the Star Wars. If you're not serving the Most High God, you have, you will. Yeah, there's by not default. really an in between. There's no in between. If you say, "Oh, I don't want to cause any trouble. I don't want to disrupt my job. I don't want to upset my relatives. I don't want to say anything that may seem like I'm a nut by thinking that the government would do 9/11, or that there may be an object approaching that could cause harm to America, or that we have safety procedures to protect our nuclear reactors." We don't. And we don't have, and even if you don't believe anything, and I, and I tell people, please, please do not elevate me to the point where anything I say, even if you, you take it out of context and you say, oh, he said this, 
Don't believe anything I say. Research it yourself. Change your own mind. But do two things. Use the witness of the Spirit with prayer. And number two, use your intellect and the brain God gave you so your skull wouldn't fall in over your eyes. Don't blame it on me and say, oh, the Deagle said, or his expert said. So, Chris, tell us what the hell is going on in Fukushima and what's going on in America, because I get increasingly aggravated by the snooze tainment out there and people who want to attack and they don't want to actually just evaluate themselves. They want, well, well they take well, something out of, yeah, they'll take something out of context completely and say, he said this. Well, well as far as Fukushima is concerned, you know, I, I can always, there's plenty of reports of radioactive fish and kelp, but I like to stick to uh, really my, my area of expertise, which is the physical plant itself and what's going on. We have been talking a lot about uh, Spencer Pool at uh, Fukushima Unit Number 4, and uh, we've been laying out some pretty, pretty technically uh, uh, information or chock, chock full of information about what could, what is likely to happen, what's, what's possible, what's a, what's a good potential to happen to stop the uh, fill pool cooling or to drain the pool and what would happen. And it seems that TEPCO, I'm not saying that they're listening to this, but I'm saying that they've stepped up the, uh, they stepped up the schedule for trying to remove the fuel from the spent fuel pool at Unit 4. And as we speak, they are removing new fuel that was stored in that spent fuel pool. Remember, that plant was going to have a refueling outage before right. for the disaster struck. That means that there was brand new fuel that gets trucked in. Brand new fuel is not very radioactive. You can touch it with your hands. Uh, we, we prefer you touch it with glove hands so that you don't contaminate the fuel. Uh, we would... Uh, so, so and it's stored in a dry location until it's until it's wet because it's very reactive. This is the stuff that's got a full full tank of let's say it's a full tank of gas. So it wasn't it in the fuel storage pod up for number four. It, it was in the new. Some of this is in the new fuel storage area. It has been ready to, to be put. It's been inspected and cleaned and ready to go. And they, that is the fuel that they are attempting to retrieve right now. And they so the the, the, the rods place. that it's in. The, the casings are still solid enough they can be they don't up know. and moved, right? That's we, the point that, is that that's, 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 that's the big question. That's the reason why. Good question. Well, uh, that's the reason, exact, uh, excellent question. That's the reason why they're trying to pull that out right now is because they don't know what it, what it would look oh. like. There's debris in that pool, and that's one of the questions that they're trying to answer is, how is, is the new fuel damage? New fuel damage is bad for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's highly, it's highly reactive. It is possible to. It's easier. It's easier to go critical on that than it is to go critical yeah, on so, spent fuels. And, and, right. and, but now the the old stuff. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is the the rods are probably broken? And well, they're probably they broken, bent, and to, to remove them, they're going to fall apart, right? Fall, uh, fall apart, or they're twisted, possible. so they won't come out in a nice, uh, even you know, slide the thing out like sliding a rod out of a, a container. Uh, let's summarize what we've got so far. What you're saying is, they've stepped up from 2013 to now to remove these fuel water assemblies. Maybe what we've said and other experts like uh, that have been out there on YouTube and etc. have been raising information on this that they know the fuel rod assembly pool, and this is uh, Dr. Gailey's research and his reports as well that you quoted a few weeks ago. They're up on yeah. E&E News, and hopefully this report will go up on E&E News as well because they need to understand if the seal breaks, even if they've removed one-third of the fuel, which is new, they can't cool those cooling rod assemblies in order to, to not go critical and pop their cork. If 10% right. goes, it'll be 30 to 100 times the radiation released last year which makes the sky shine so radioactive, none of the surface areas from cooling from re reactor number one that's basically gone critical ever since. Reactor two, that we know the corium is well under the reactor. Reactor three, it's having serious events happen with a mox mixed oxygen fuel plutonium reactor. The whole situation is going so. interesting summary here too uh, uh, so we know the Fukushima thing they're doing what we call stage one which I think is kind of like you said the low hour fly, hanging fruit to get these uh, one third of the reactor cooling before our assemblies there is a crane there apparently over that open part of the roof but they also put a cap over the rest of it 
that uh, structural integrity of the building, we mentioned just before the break that subsidence because of superheated steam created by uh, groundwater and tritiated water superheating it combined with the shaking from repeated earthquakes. It's five times more earthquakes of a level five or greater since March 11th last year. Those earthquakes are increasing like a kettle drum, like one of those boom, 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 boom. And the reason is the approach of this dwarf star nemesis. And as it approaches, it causes gravity waves. Those gravity waves shake the tectonic plates of the Earth. They also trigger off deep nuclear reactions in the sun that cause coronal mass ejections. And uh, we're going to see more great big, we call kill shots, that could fly past the Earth like a madman with a, with a mask on, shooting a shotgun while spinning on a rotating platform. Uh, and well, you have to think of that. Means, well, I'm sorry. To us, to us, it means that uh, we weren't prying wolf or anything about uh, removing the fuel. It, it's, they really are doing it. They're trying. Right. Well, that's, that's good. So, they're trying. What, what yeah. I would say that be the first thing besides trying to remove it, if they find the assembly rods will cannot come out, they need to reconvert it from thinking this is a nuclear reactor to a toxic waste site, and they need to figure out how can we stop the criticality and stop it from heating at all. And that would be to put in uh, boronated brine and turn it into a giant crystalline kind of superstructure that stays there forever. And literally turn it into a, into a mausoleum of a nuclear reactor. That's what we need to be. It needs to be turned into a Fukushima mausoleum. Uh, but it needs to not be under a sarcophagus is of Congress. But is it a stable enough area to do, well, to do that? Oh, yeah, you, you, can, it there. You, you can enshroud it. There's ways of doing that. Uh, first off, I've heard crazy ideas like trying to create a small nuke to suck it into the ground. It would just pull more into the groundwater right away and create more immediate catastrophe. What you want to do is you want to put in something that would immediately stop criticality. You want to actually form a crystal structure. Then once it's all formed in a giant crystal structure, then you can, in a sense, in layers, create a sarcophagus. But you have to put spider silk, Kevlar tents over it, filtration systems, a corium catcher underneath it. Nobody even has data or will give us any data on where the corium is, ground penetrating radiator, what's called uh, ion scanning uh, technology, which we have, and what's called torsion field scanning. Literally from space or from an aircraft can actually see those radioisotopes. Most people aren't aware of it because it's classified and I have classified clearance, so I know we have it. Every city in the Western world is scanned with a helicopter and with jets from space and from near space up to 30, 50,000 feet and lower altitude. Every city is scanned for radioisotopes in every city in America, in Canada, in the West, in Australia, every week. Every week. That's okay, also so they, why they know that there are hot spots in certain Israeli embassies and consulates. That's right. In fact, after 9-11, the they, they discovered that after 9-11, there were two places that were hot in New York. It was the Great Kills landfill site from, nuclear, from the nuclear debris from 9-11 and the Israeli embassy in uh, Manhattan. Yeah, Those are the two hot spots. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So one, there's oh, another well, report here we need to get into that is about the NRC dealing with San Onofre, and I want you to hop into this one now, because this is important, and you have a number of points here. This is hot off the presses. What do they say, Chris? Okay, so they're coming up with certain root causes of the many, many tube indications. Indication means that uh, the non-destructive non, non examination picked up a flaw in the tube. A lot of these were beyond the 35% of the wall thickness. You're talking about tube that's... Uh, 0.043 inches in, di in, in uh, not diameter, 0.043 inches thick. That's pretty thin. So uh, that's, that's a pretty thin piece of uh, metal. And if you have 35% uh, of that's gone, then you have to plug it by law. So they, they found a lot of those with that. We're, and, and I'm going through the report, you know, and, and I can kind of read the way, the way it's going. Only two of these uh, tubes were in this area. And the way, the way, they're, the way they're actually... It sounds like it sounds like they're going to permit restart. I mean, I, I haven't gone through the whole thing yet, and I can't read their minds. It sounds like that, that that's the way they're going right now, and, and there's a, uh, but not not right away. And I, I said, well, uh, but I Chris, how did they let something like that <laughs> pass? Because I many years ago, I, I uh, was interviewed for a company that did uh, testing uh, uh, in, for the construction of, of nuclear facilities, and and it, it, it was to X-ray, you know, they X-ray everything, every pipe, every the walls, everything. How did they? How could they? Particularly if you're talking about thin tubes, how the hell could they? They let that get passed. Uh, it's, it's going to be difficult for me to go ahead and summarize a 95-page report down in, in a few words, but I'm going to say that. Due to uh, a lot of the manufacturing processes that were different from the original ones, and it looks like, and it really, it makes a lot of sense to me that instead of really securing these tubes 
uh, to something solid inside, like it's called the steam generator wrapper. These this had a free floating uh, uh, a tube anti vibration uh, plate put in, and that these steam generators were that actually encouraged the vibration of the tubes instead of stopping or dampening it. So they were actually banging against each other in, in oh, certain Lord. areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and of course, and, by the way, this this, this uh, precipitated an immediate report you did just literally before the show, which means, because yeah. we only have about four minutes left, what's really going on here, and you got to summarize this, we got a problem that they want to restart the plant because they only had, quote, a few hundred tubes, they said at first we were gone when it was well over 1,500. There's a structural engineering defect. This reactor should never be restarted. Not, not with those steam generators. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to, like I said, I got to keep on reading through this thing. I just got it. It was hot off the press. When the, I just recognized the buzzwords in some of these uh, particular uh, reports. And uh, you know you can't minimize something like this because just because a thousand tubes had only twenty percent of the wall thickness indication, well, how do you know that when you run it again, it's not going to get to be forty percent or sixty percent or full wall? You know, full. Uh, you don't know that. I don't see that in the report. Right well, now. let me read the last see. paragraph here. I've got it right in front yeah. of me. At the San Onofre NRC requires steam generator tubes with more than thirty-five percent wear to be plugged. As reported by the company to the NRC last week, Unit 2, 1,595 uh, tubes showed somewhere, and 510 were plugged. Six tubes were wear out more than 35%. In Unit 3, 1,806 tubes showed wear of some kind. 807 tubes were plugged. 381 tubes had wear generated uh, generate greater than 35%. The license uh, chose to plug some tubes with wear less than 35% as a preventive measure. Details of Unit 2 wear can be found here. And at this location, they have links there. Each reactor has two steam generators, and each turbine uh, generates 9,600, has the 9,627 yeah, tubes. 90, yeah. ba- basically, okay. what they're saying is, we screwed up on the design. They did what's called like-for-like like engineering, which basically says they put on more tubes than they had. They didn't stabilize it against what's called the plate. So the tubes are literally, as they're generating steam, because they have normal water circulating outside the tubes and hot radioactive water inside the tubes, and the tubes, as they generate steam, cause the tubes to vibrate and then bang against each other uh, and eventually wear, which means radioactive water has been vented in this reactor for years. This well, reactor has been venting off radioisotopes in the in the area of Southern California for years. And when it finally blew, what happened is September 8th, they had a station blackout caused in Yuma, Arizona, and that blackout caused what's called hot shutdown, where the surge in temperature in the tubes caused a lot of them to immediately blow, and then they became evident that there was a problem. The problem, though, was going on for years before that. It didn't just happen because they had a station blackout on September 8, 2011. It's because there was an engineering flaw, and now they need to make sure that they never restart those three steam turbines. And so these two latest ones are only put in the last two years. I know the senior engineer who's my next-door neighbor here for years, and he told me there were all kinds of whistleblower problems and other things, and they eventually fired him. Okay, he was one of the senior engineers at San Onofre. So this is not conjecture. This is firsthand information, and I can tell you, now what we've weeded out here, and if people like Jay Leno think, oh, well, don't worry, your fancy cars won't get radioactive in Los Angeles, you're dangerously close to the wind drifts in your direction. San Onofre has a lot of nuclear material on board, and if these tubes are, quote, just plugged and they're still leaking, we could have a major rupture and a major amount of radiation released there. When September 8th happened, my back, my my radiation detector, which was already going up, you know, two to three times background radiation on and off because of Fukushima, it went up to four times background up to around the mid 80s, and it stayed there for three to four days after the September 8th blackout. Guys, I, I, I grew up around bars. My dad owned owned them uh, in in his business, and and the. That many to, to be plugged or damaged, uh, that's, that's an insane number. These are new. Why, I mean, why, the, why, why doesn't the company that, that, that we put, bought these from, Hitachi, these companies, be responsible? Well, you know, these are like, uh, I think it was $600 million a piece for each one of these steam turbines yeah, that they bought. Who, who's, got, who's got the money to cover that? I mean, really, if you think about it. Yeah, you know yeah. what they want to do? They want to stick us with it, with the Southern California Edison. And, of course, they'll try to spread the cost to San Diego Gas and Electric that buys power from them where I live, 12 miles from, from uh, 12 miles away from... Ground Zero at San Onofre. Thank God it's shut down and it'll stay shut down or else we'll file lawsuits.